Uh, it's my huge, huge pleasure to introduce um, uh, Julie Cohen to you. I suspect everybody knows Julie's work here, but just a few um, brief notes. She is a uh, professor at the um, Georgetown School of Law, but is um, visiting here at Harvard Law School for the entire year, which is fabulous for us and for our students. She's teaching variants of the classes that she teaches there here, ranging from um, copyright to um, uh, property in the first year and advanced um, theory of uh, intellectual property and so forth, which has been uh, fabulous. The great news also for us is that she's in the middle or the near the end, I suppose, of a book project. Um, uh, I know um, Julie's work primarily by reading um, all of the articles that she comes out with in law reviews and so forth, which are um, important. Um, uh, elements of our field in cyber law. Um, if you were to read um, any one of those, um, my favorite uh, is actually in some ways maybe the most recent, the one on privacy and transparency um, uh, in the Chicago Law Review, um, which uh, I would commend to all of you if you're in the business of reading uh, law review articles. Um, and I know there's some of those themes that are carried through into the book, I would imagine that Julie's going to um, talk about here. Um, on configuring the network self, and um, with that, I will turn it over to Julie for the next 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, thank you so much, John, and thanks to the Berkman Center for inviting me to do this, and to all of you for showing up. Uh, and the, um, the little blurb on the web made reference to uh, structural conditions of human flourishing, which is something that comes at the very end of this book that I've been writing. And so what I thought I would do is um, spend actually more time giving you background than talking about chapter nine, but I'll, I'll get there. Um, uh, so, um, so I'm going to kind of set the table for that. And if you're wondering why I'm not getting to it, I will get to it eventually. But so, um, so the book, uh, Configuring the Network Self, is... Um, motivated by, uh, an, way back when, when I started working on it, by two things that really struck me about the discourse around information law and policy. Um, and when I say the discourse, I'm referring to the US law and policy discourse. Um, there are differences um, between that discourse and, for example, the European discourse in certain respects, so I'm not making a claim to be talking about that. Um, but within the U.S. Uh, legal and policy space, the, um, the two things that struck me as odd were, number one, that we make a lot of grandiose pronouncements about designing um, laws and infrastructures that facilitate free speech or facilitate market choice. So there's a lot of freedom being floated around, um, freedom, in, in, expressive freedom, market freedom. And yet, quite often, at the end of the day, there's a set of results that seems um, in many ways antithetical to the interests of the individuals and communities that have to exist and go about their business within this space to the extent that they're told a whole bunch of things they can't do with content owned by other people. There are relatively few barriers to um, collection and aggregation of information about people and uh, observation of what they do. Um, the world of artifacts within which we move is increasingly seamless and opaque. It's sort of a hallmark of good design that, you know, everything has to look like an iPhone, but it's really hard to figure out how it works uh, and what it's doing. Um, so there's a disconnect between the, the discourse about all these freedoms and the way it actually seems to work. Um, and then the second disconnect is um, is you know, should be easy enough for people listening to recognize it's the disconnect between the um, the copyright-centered debate about cultural environmentalism and enclosure and free culture on the one hand and the privacy debate about the other. Uh, on the other hand, um, the, the, um, there's a, the free culture debate is all about openness and often seems to me to be about openness to such a great extent that um, it's impossible um, or at least very difficult um, to, to contemplate how privacy claims might be um, reconciled within that discourse about open, 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 and, and to, to contemplate um, how that might work architecturally, and thus for advocates, free culture advocates and privacy advocates, to make common cause with one another because um, of the, the um, ways in which openness becomes fraught. Um, and so it's puzzling about these disconnects that I experienced. Um, and 
what I ended up deciding, um, and, and so I'll, I'll state for you now um, the major substantive thesis of the book and also a major um, methodological thesis of the book, they're related, is that um, we make these laws and policies and we have these debates about freedom within a frame of reference that at least within the US law and policy discourse derives from liberal political theory to a very large extent. And so there are um, terms that get tossed around like autonomy and freedom um, and there are presumptions that get tossed around like um, uh, rational choice and um, disembodied um, uh, 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 individuals who can play in the realm of the virtual um, and, uh, and uh, who can exercise autonomous choice in markets that are increasingly virtual. And that's not really a, a, a worldview that has much relation to reality, in my opinion, um, uh, and uh, it, what we ought to be focusing on if we want to understand, um, for example, why a free culture agenda might be important or why privacy might be important and how you might reconcile a wish for greater openness in culture and a wish for more effective protection of privacy would be to focus um, on the experience, what I call the experience geography of the networked information society, on the conditions that govern information flows to and from and about people on the fact that those people are real and embodied and localized in cultures and contexts and are experiencing the network um, indirectly as it's mediated by devices and platforms and interfaces um, and have to learn how to make it work somehow. Um, the What I'm describing as the, the framework um, sort of ported in from liberal theory doesn't tend to give us good tools to ask those questions because um, if you, for example, start from the presumption that the self is autonomous and separate from culture, um, then it's going to be very difficult to ask how selves are constituted by culture and how the rules that we make about access to culture result in different different um, uh, uh, consequences and that, that we need to evaluate. Um, if you treat the self as autonomous and separate from culture, it's going to be different, difficult to say things about how regimes of privacy or more privacy or less privacy um, uh, result in meaningful um, uh, significant consequences for um, uh, the way that we experience uh, our culture and the way that our political discourse works. Uh, and so it turned out when I read some more that actually there are lots of folks that do ask these questions. They just don't primarily seem to be operating in law. Um, they're, you know, people who work in cultural studies, people who work in information studies and science and technology studies. Um, and if I haven't mentioned your field, but <laughs> insert you know, here, lots of people in the room are, are in these other areas. There, there are whole literatures about this. Um, you know, that often often sort of encapsulated by legal scholars under the umbrella term postmodernist, which is then kind of used in a very pejorative way, um, which I think is unfortunate. And so one um, sort of overall purpose of the book project is to unpack that set of literatures and 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 uh, um, ask, okay, well, if we pay attention to actually how the information society works on the level of um, situ what I call situated embodied users of networks and network and information and how um, and how uh, those situated embodied users experience uh, information technologies, we may be able to learn some things that then could inform our thinking about information law and policy. Um, the and and so the book seeks to do that um, and seeks to do it within an overall um, normative framework informed substantially but not completely by the um, the uh, Amartya Sen Martha Nussbaum um, theory of uh, capabilities for human flourishing. Um, so I state just as a, as a, this is my you know my normative prior that we ought to be uh, seeking to pursue a regime of information law and policy that will promote human flourishing that will furnish people with the capabilities to flourish flourish meaningfully and there's great work that's been done by a whole bunch of folks on access to knowledge and network neutrality um, for example that talks about um, uh, talks about uh, for example um, that one needs meaningful access to culture in order to be able to participate in 
politics in culture as culture um, in life, uh, and therefore, um, uh, and therefore, a set of intellectual property rules should um, should take those considerations into account. Um, where I part company, though, with that framework. Um, is um, is the extent to which that framework also tries to situate itself within the liberal tradition, and and it's a, I have a theory about why they do that, which I won't bore you with now. Um, but it tends to result in a fair amount of indeterminacy, and so a critique that's often leveled about the, at the capabilities theory is that you could just make anything into it into a required capability for flourishing, um, uh, because uh, you could to the extent that you could argue that it becomes affirmatively necessary for people to have it in order to flourish. Um, how do we make that framework more concrete, how do we lend it content? Um, I argue you lend it content by actually looking at these postmodern literatures that tell us um, important things about the mutually constituting relationships between self and culture, between self and community, between uh, technology and culture uh, and community. Um, and, uh, and then you lend the theory of capabilities for human flourishing content by being able to say things about how those processes work. Um, um, and in consequence, what kinds of guarantees or spaces the laws should attempt to provide. Um, the, there are some concepts that we might come back to in the Q&A, but I don't want to just talk and talk and talk. Um, what emerge as three critical reference points for that inquiry um, are, uh, first of all, um, what I've already I've already referred to the notion that selves are mutually, are, are constituted by culture, um, but more narrowly, uh, the first critical reference point for this inquiry is um, what I refer to as the mutually constituting relationship between information technologies and embodied perception. Um, you all experience, whether or not you stop to think about it, the tools that you have as reconfiguring your access to the world. Um, and it's not just virtual. Um, it's it's a relationship between you, your situated self, and the geography of the world that is changing and changing again and being remediated um, uh, in part by the characteristics of this device or interface or platform that is between you and everything else. Um, and uh, and there is a whole bunch of good thinking about how to theorize that, how to understand it, how to describe it, um, and how to interrogate it. The second critical reference point is the concept of everyday practice, um, which is um, sort of an anti-paradigm uh, that's useful for describing what people do. Um, so if you read the legal literature, you often find um, a dominant paradigm that says, for example, we should evaluate um, the consequences of a particular legal or architectural regime by reference to its effect on political discourse and speech, or by reference to its effect on freedom of speech, or by reference to its effect on whether people can make free and informed choices in markets. And those frames tend to um, tend to yield pretty reductive models of human behavior. So at the end of the day, you're kind of sitting there scratching your head going, well, is all people do just run around making rational choices in markets? Or are we instead to think of people as constantly animated by um, romantic you know, notions of political dissent um, uh, uh, and, and critical commentary? You see this in the fair use jurisprudence a lot. Everyday practice is, is a, is a um, concept uh, uh, that's used to describe sort of all of the everything else. Um, you know, having a beer and watching the football game today and engaging in political commentary tomorrow and going to buy an eye touch the next day and everything else that comes in between um, and how people, um, how people um, uh, uh, engage in behaviors and how they make sense of them to themselves and in their communities. Um, everyday practice is not linear. Um, it is not always animated by overarching strategies. It's often very reactive. Um, it's often very tactical. So there's a great website that people set up to go walk around New York City and not go in front of any surveillance camera. Um, that's a tactical response to the increasing deployment of surveillance cameras. And it's very ad hoc. It's not like somebody sat down to, to devise a political theory before they set that up. They just did it. Um, uh, I think there's something valuable to be learned um, from focusing on everyday practice as the dominant conception of how people do what they do. Um, and then the third critical reference point is the notion of play. Okay, uh, play. Okay, 
the, the third point is the notion of play. Um, play is uh, a concept that appears particularly in the intellectual property literature um, uh, when people um, uh, critique the breadth of the copyright rules, they often say something like, and then uh, we see, therefore, that people should have freedom to play with cultural resources. Um, and play is important. It's linked in a lot of literatures to creativity, to invention. Um, yet I think all of that discussion about deliberate intentional play that people engage in needs to be broadened to encompass another conception or definition of play as just the play of circumstances, right? The, um, the idea that creativity, for example, will blossom not just because you decide today that you want to play, but because life puts random stuff in your way. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, if you go and read uh, 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 for example, the work of people who have done uh, historical studies of great moments in art, uh, or who, who interview contemporary artists, quite often that's what you get back. You know, I don't know why I thought of that, but life threw this and this and this in my path, and I mixed them together, and that's what came out. Um, so there's a sense of play, uh, not as play by individuals, but play of play of circumstances, play of, of random stuff that life puts in your way. Um, and that play um, and is, is, is uh, a critical part of what we should, I argue, be seeking to foster in our information policy, and it's a, it's a critical condition of human flourishing. So structural conditions of human flourishing um, that emerge after I take these three critical reference points and, and work through them um, in chapters about copyright, privacy, architecture, code. Um, are as follows. One, access to knowledge. Um, I think it's important. I think great work has been done on access to knowledge. But I don't think access to knowledge is enough to, um, to supply a base for human flourishing in the networked information society um, because it doesn't get you all the things that turn out to be important. It doesn't, for example, get you rights to reuse cultural products um, unless you're willing to define access as encompassing rights of reuse, I guess you could, but it seems to be that we're talking about two different things. Um, we're talking about the ability to access stuff in the first place, and um, second, the flexibility in the legal structure that allows you to take things and reuse them. A2K doesn't guarantee you, for example, rights of privacy. In fact, to the extent the access uh, uh, frame has anything to say about privacy, it usually tends to say things about how more openness is good. Um, so there are two other conditions that I think we need to add to, um, uh, to begin developing a taxonomy of structural conditions for human flourishing in the networked information society. Um, the first of those is operational transparency. Um, we need to know how these digital architectures work. Um, it is not enough, for example, to require um, data aggregators to disclose to you what information they have collected about you. You need to know how it's going to be used. It is not enough to say you have a choice between Google and whatever, right? <laughs> um, it is not enough to say you have a choice between iPhone and Blackberry or between, um, you know, take your pick. You have to be given enough information to know what options are being presented to you and what options are being foreclosed. Um, in order to know something about the work that these devices that are mediating your perception of the information environment are doing. Um, and third, semantic discontinuity. This is my favorite one. Um, so so uh, this chapter at the end of the book argues that um, uh, there's a thing called semantic discontinuity that is a vital structural condition of human flourishing in the networked information society. And what it is is formal incomplete incompleteness in legal and technical uh, uh, infrastructures. For example, copyright. Formal incompleteness in copyright rights such that to reuse culture you don't need to invoke a catch-all defense like fair use and pray you can convince somebody. Um, but there is actually space left over for play. Um, the, for example, in privacy, um, rigid 
arbitrary, unreasonable rules against transacting in and aggregating personal data such that there is space left over for people to play with identity, to engage in unpredictable conduct, um, and to, to have their senses of self um, evolve within this space left over. For example, in the realms of architecture, and this one's going to push people's buttons if the privacy one didn't already, um, if, you, if you read the computer science literature, there is an ingrained, completely unquestioned norm that life will be better and better and better for everybody if we have seamless interoperability between everything, everywhere, all the time, data, platforms, interfaces, you name it. Um, and I guess that's really good for some purposes, but a consequence of that um, uh, just uh, automatic, um, unquestioned regress to seamless interoperability is, um, for example, that data about you moves around and around and around without your ability to know where it's going or to stop it. It's that, um, uh, for example, people will say, oh, great, you know, social networks are great. One network is great. Another network is great. Wouldn't it be even better if we combine them to make one big social network? Um, and it turns out um, that to the extent you scale up, um, certain desirable features of that network are magnified and certain <laughs> undesirable features of that network are magnified. You lose uh, uh, to a very meaningful extent whatever ability to control uh, uh, the, the, the visibility of, of your data and your behavior um, uh, compared to what you had before. Uh, and if all we think is important is open exchange of data, I guess that would make sense. But if what we think is important is um, play and everyday practice and play in the two senses that I've talked about, deliberate play and interstitial play, right? The play of circumstances um, running into unexpected stuff within gaps in the network. Um, I think we ought to think that through again. Uh, uh, there's a real extent to which I think human beings benefit from discontinuity um, of the sort that I'm identifying and trying to focus on. Um, and so I, that's a conversation that I want to start, even if it takes us to some really strange places. And with that, I will stop and open the floor. Awesome. This is going to be so. a great book and a great conversation. I have a sense there are some reactions from the crew. Who wants first? Charles. Um, I have played in this area for a while, um, dealing with identity issues and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we realized early on was that people need to have the freedom to have multiple personas. Mm -hmm. So Church Lady 43 may be Porn Star 562, mm -hmm. right? And, then, and, that, and those worlds should be separate at some level, but as things become more integrated, those, those that they tend to, these things tend to get blurred. Mm -hmm. And then we have the issue of maybe that person is also terrorist 65. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is one of those. And then we have the, the, re, the security theater reaction to that, mm -hmm. um, which, which kind of gets to the point of your uh, whole, uh, I, I think the reason this, this is such, a, such an important issue to discuss, mm -hmm. um, because we could wind up where We've got this seamless integrated world where all I'm, I'm careful on saying is anything I would say in a work environment. So I can't talk politics, I can't talk religion, I, I can't really have opinions that mm -hmm. are unpopular in, in that world. And that quaffs so many positive things about how we can evolve as a society. What I worry about mm -hmm. is Joe McCarthy coming back and asking you, are you or have you ever been a member of this group, mm -hmm. which, which is now in disfavor? Because in 50 or 60 years, we've seen <coughs> social norms change completely. Yeah, that's, a, I mean, yes, that's a, that's a great so comment. So we is need there to a, have that discussion. Uh, and, uh -huh. and, and the legal aspects of uh -huh. that, uh -huh. I think, are... Um, the, there's open territory here that need that this, there needs to be more definition than there is now. Right. That seems totally right. consistent with what Julie yeah, said. Yeah, absolutely, exactly. absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a pushback that often is a response to that, which is, um, you know, but if you restrict the flow of information in X way, we will slide down a slippery slope to Chinese <laughs> internet censorship or what I'm looking at Donnie or whatever. Um, yeah. And um, that's, 
I think we have to move out of the security of that in order to have the conversation because it's actually not true, right? Um, there's always uh, a sense in which inf information flows are limited and structured in particular ways. You can't have protocols, for example, that just let everything go everywhere. Um, but we have to be, I think, more willing to kind of open the door to saying, okay, um, uh, there are these competing considerations we're trying to balance here, some of which um, involve having accurate knowledge and others of which don't. Um, how can we make this work? Charlie? Yeah, I perked up when you uh, talked about copyright mm -hmm. and the need for play at the joints without yes. the playful person having to fend off uh, claims with defenses of fair use. Mm -hmm. and my understanding is that, well, the way it is right now, that, that is exactly the situation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, have you got some approach that would create this space of playfulness that one doesn't need to defend? With so fair I use? do, um, in a funny way, right? And it's a funny way because it would involve going back and looking at the 1909 U.S. Copyright Act and asking, what were some good things about this law? Um, that was a law that is just reviled um, by copyright scholars and policymakers today because, for example, instead of saying, um, as the current law does, you get exclusive rights in original works of authorship regardless of, you know, the manner or medium in which they're expressed, it had categories, right? And you couldn't even get the rights unless you fell within categories like lecture or essay or dramatic work or whatever. Um, and then the rights were much more narrowly limited, so not all categories of works got all rights, and that's still true to a limited extent today, but it's true to a much lesser degree, and it's reviled because um, uh, the um, pressure on the copyright industry side to expand that framework was overwhelming. You know, how can it be, um, the argument would go, that you erect an arbitrary legal framework that makes unsustainable distinctions between different modes of expression with the result that um, uh, actions that have a bottom line consequence can't be appropriated, right, can't be. Um, and, and I think we need to just flip that around. Um, uh, we need to be willing not to go back to exactly what the 1909 Act said, um, but to define rights to reproduction and to adaptation in a way that gives certain very significant rights still to copyright owners, and I can talk about why I still think that, but quite clearly and unambiguously reserves lots of other things to users and does so without regard to this really annoying criterion of actual or potential market effect, which in the hands of a court can always get you know, blown into a reason for extending the right to cover whatever it is the users have done. Um, I think, um, well, let me stop and ask if, but if you're that... But you running up against the pocketbook of the copyright holders who say you're giving away our testimony. Yeah, patrimony. yeah, um, of course. And, and, you know, there's a limit to what one can do in any one piece of scholarship, and there needs to be something, which this is not... Um, that um, uh, that uh, takes what I'm doing here sort of as a, as a theoretical matter um, and says, okay, how do we get there? Um, yeah, and I absolutely agree with you, getting there is no mean feat. Um, but I do think part of getting there involves beginning a discourse about the various meanings of play and the various values of play and seeking to make it understood that everybody benefits from that. Um, that it's not just a bunch of crazy YouTube posters, um, for example, that benefit from that, but it's even the mass culture industries themselves benefit from that because there's a circulation and a ferment um, that then redounds to their benefit as well. Um, what about you, Professor Nesson? Do you see a narrative here from Julie's story that leads to the reform that you have an interest in? <clears throat> well, uh, I... Uh, approach it at the most fundamental level mm -hmm. of whether there's some presumption mm -hmm. of fair use rather than a presumption against it. Uh, and right now, the burden that she describes is really overwhelming, even for non-commercial uh, people who are copying without any profit motive. 
they still have to fend off this uh, extraordinary assault that can be made on them. So I'm um, just starting from the law perspective of shifting the presumption in a way that clearly represents the playfulness of the consumer, mm -hmm. uh, the end-using consumer on the end would be a huge step forward, I think. I saw you trying to do this in the Tenenbaum case a bunch of times to focus on the user and the, that whole experience. It seems it's actually not at all um, out of step with the <coughs> overall methodological project that Julie's trying to well, advance here. I am, um, I'm fascinated by this project and I'm really looking forward to the book. Um, I um, am interested particularly in the, the sort of literature you refer to about, um, you said that the, the lawyers uh, denigrate as POMO this embodied understanding of the everyday. Mm -hmm. um, because when you said it, it made me think of a book that was published about 10 years ago, 1999, um, that was boldly titled The Internet um, by, uh, <laughs> by an anthropologist and a sociologist. Um, and it would, I don't know if you know it, but the idea, they, um, <clears throat> it was it's considered by some to be a groundbreaking, groundbreaking sort of work in uh, embodied local cultural understanding of the Internet. And they thought, we are just around the corner in 1999 from an understanding in social science that the internet is really local and embodied and cultural. And what we need to do is to write the first book of the flourishing of books that will follow that will explain how this works. And their book was about Trinidad because they happen to be, one of them is an anthropologist of Trinidad. And so he wrote this book about the internet in Trinidad and the argument is basically that you know, if you're, if you're in Trinidad, the internet is one thing and if you're not, it's a different thing. And it has to do with being Trini. And uh, what we need are many of these different understandings mm -hmm. of local internets and what it means to have an embodied everyday experience of local internet. And the subtitle of the book is An Ethnographic Approach. So the argument mm -hmm. was that the internet colon an ethnographic approach is the, the big turn that's going to come. And mm -hmm. in other writing, they said that they rushed it into print because they saw that this big turn in social science was like right around the corner. And there's going to be like the internet colon an ethnographic approach in and then country X or mm -hmm. group X. Um, but it didn't really happen, did it? I mean, there's there's still a... I mean, the, the ideas that you refer to, if I, if I take your literature right, it doesn't seem to have exactly carried the day. I mean, you definitely find people working in this vein, but neither is it this, um, neither when we hear the internet do we leap to the idea that it is, uh, of course, embodied and particular and extremely different if you're one kind of person versus another kind of person or in one country versus another. I mean, there's some of it, of course, and you referred to Chinese censorship that maybe as an example, but I, I wonder, could you say more about this literature that, you're, that you referred to? Right. So, um, you know, I haven't seen within, for example, um, mainstream U.S. legal scholarship and mainstream policy studies and, you know, think tank documents about digital policy, um, a recognition of this. What, what seems to me to happen, although I would love to discover totally exceptions, yeah. is that there's a thing called a digital divide, and you have to overcome it, right? If you are still in some, you know, benighted urban, you know, inner city place somewhere or in some shack on the edge of the grid and your connectivity is limited or you don't really know enough to use the internet for all the things that you need to use it for, we want to help you get over that. Um, uh, and, you know, that's good and bad, right? I don't want to say it's, it's all bad. It would be nice, for example, to have a national broadband policy like the one in the Berkman report. Um, but um, it would be really nice not to do that in a way that denies all of what you just talked about. Um, and it, it, it doesn't seem to be in So like internet there. adoption as assimilation. I mean, that sounds kind of Borg-like, but it's more, um, you know, there's a, there's a, 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 there seems to be an assumption that um, there's a, a sort of uniform digital ethos and level of competency that we just have to get everybody to, and depending on what report you read, it would be market-oriented or expression-oriented, um, but that kind of seems to be what, what it is. John Markerson there. No. Uh, Salil David Fernando. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, see if you could follow, uh, elaborate a bit on mm -hmm. uh, the implication that uh, interoperability, the desire for interoperability implies a 
um, so that information should flow everywhere. That seems to me that a, a response could be that these are two separate things, and we don't want information to not flow because um, because things are incompatible. But uh, rather, if we want information not to flow, it should be because of an explicit um, decision in the architecture mm -hmm. um, that, a, that, that there is some policy decision and that the architecture could be designed to allow certain information flows and not allow other information flows. Mm -hmm. And that's a separate thing from mm -hmm. the question of compatibility and interoperability. Um. I don't know that I necessarily would want to exclude either one of those options. Um, the so um, so we could imagine, right, that we everybody thinks this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and everybody's on board with semantic discontinuity and digital architectures, and we're just going to design uh, and decree by fiat you know, a system of, um, of randomized incompatibilities, right? Um, there's a value to um, having those incompatibilities emerge in other ways than by design. And there's a value to not fixing some of the ones that exist in the world, um, even though at this point, we don't, by and large, tend to think about it that way. Um, and, and so I think that um, the challenge is how to design gaps, right? Or how to design a, a, a framework that encourages gaps to appear and rewards gaps that appear. And if you think about it, it's almost like everything is driving against that. Um, I got to the end of the book and I was like, geez, I have to write something about capital markets, right? Mm -hmm. There was a piece in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago about how open source um, companies that do well tend to get bought by proprietary companies and become subsidiaries and nobody really knows like what they're doing with them or how they could be managed differently if that hadn't happened. Capital markets reward interconnection um, and at a very, very basic level that matters. Um, I'm sorry? Assimilation. Yeah. Yeah, Borg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm fighting that, but but, um, but yeah, and 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 uh, and so, you know, either it's a completely quixotic and ridiculous idea, or it's really important, but they, there are just a lot of moving parts. I don't know if that's the that's answer you envisioned, but. So I, I guess. It, what you're saying is that the mm -hmm. kind of gaps that you have in mind are, are not necessarily ones that can really be designed in the way that <coughs> computer science is. There are ones good. that I think would emerge if some of the rules were different because people want to do them. I had an RA once go and look for discussions on open source groups about forking. Um, and it was so interesting what she found. Um, there are these discussions, right? Some of you have been involved in some of them or have seen them. and. This is a, a core tenet of open source, right? If you don't like the way the standard's going, you can fork it. Um, but people get so anxious um, because it's at war with this other deeply held belief that everything should talk to everything else. Um, but constantly people are seeking to fork and to create their own communities. And it seems that, um, that, uh, that it, it would be good to respect that and find ways to enable it. David. Um, after a number of years here, having the techno determinism more or less kicked out of me, mm -hmm. I find it hasn't entirely. So awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, are are you you find awesome the fact that I've had the techno determinism mainly kicked out of me, or that there's a residue that I'm about to ask you about? <laughs> <laughs> and as a good postmodernist, I have to say both, right? Oh, okay. um, <laughs> um, so I I. I, 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 I <laughs> I love your talk and where you're going with this, so thank you. Let me just be clear thank about you. that. Um, um, so, given that the internet is different, if you are is is a different thing mm -hmm. because of your embodied experience of it. If mm -hmm. you are in Trinidad as opposed to if you're in Cambridge, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, which I 
seems to me incontestably true and really important to keep in mind, especially for aging techno determinists. Um, nevertheless, I find myself thinking that, you know, yes, but there are things that anybody who goes on the internet, in, is as long as the internet is in any recognizable form, so there are conceivable sort of pared down things that violate all sorts of, of rules and norms and canons of the internet that I'm going to put aside. Mm -hmm. But whether you're in Trinidad or you're in Beijing or you are in Cambridge, if you're on the internet, you don't see necessarily all the same, you won't see all the same things, but you will have the sense that um, ideas can be linked, which is a really powerful um, new capability that there's a huge amount of information, more than you could ever consume, mm -hmm. that, that you could ever touch, that a lot of that information was put up by people like you, not simply by people who have access to publishing systems, um, that there is an, an amazing amount of disagreement on the internet, even in fairly controlled internet uh, versions of the internet, there's a tremendous amount of disagreement at every level, um, that those things are constant for any culture, any cultural encounter with the internet, you come away, I, so I, I'm proposing this, but I don't know mm -hmm. if that's right. You come away with things like that. that, And so that makes me think, well, damn it, I'm a techno-determinist again, because I'm saying that any encounter, no matter how embodied, what embodiment, what culture, is still going to come away believing and knowing those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So is that, am I wrong about that residue? Is that itself so enculturated that, um, yeah, it's true, but it's that very level of residue is taken up differently by different cultures and by different embodied individuals within those cultures. Or is there something that actually can be said across cultures about our experience of the internet? Um, well, I think there there certainly are things that can be said across cultures about it. It all depends on your level of abstraction, right? It's good to have access to all this information. That's pretty abstract. Um, people will see the information and make different things of it. Um, uh, for some reason, I'm thinking of the, the Wikipedia page about the village that kept getting relabeled as Israeli or Palestinian um, as, a, as a really good example of that. But the, the, you know, it doesn't have to be an example that's so fraught. Um, I, I think you're only a technological determinist if you believe that there's only one way to get there. Um, you know, that there's only one set of rules under which we could continue to live under conditions that in which there is lots of information available on the web. Um, <clears throat> and that anything that we might do to fork some of the flows or protect privacy will jeopardize all the rest of it. And I just don't think that it's at all obvious that that's right. But I didn't necessarily understand you to be saying that. So I guess I have to ask you whether that's what you're saying. Um, no. Well, it's not exactly. Uh, that may be a consequence of what I'm saying. I, mm -hmm. I guess I'm asking, it, uh, I guess more, um, not at the level of how we get there, but how deeply the postmodern critique cuts. So the... Um, is there, your postmodernism generally doesn't like residues mm -hmm. because it's always about finding the residue and saying, ah, you've got a residue, and then showing that you, mm -hmm, you're actually mm -hmm. able to pull right. that rug right. and you know, sort of residue right. all the way down. So right. I'm suggesting that there's, um, as a hypothesis, that there mm -hmm. is in fact a residue mm -hmm. that's cross-cultural, mm -hmm. that is, it, I'll say it, it uh, close to inevitable, uh, and it's not just that these are generalities, mm -hmm. these are really deep and important things. Mm -hmm. that, that Ideas can be linked. Yeah, that's broad generality, but it also uh, implies a restructuring of many cultures' view of how knowledge and discourse works. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, people disagree endlessly. Um, that's pretty general, but it's also really concrete because you see these people are arguing and all different. Uh, so, um, is there a residue? Is is there a set of stuff that after we go after we acknowledge mm -hmm. uh, deep and important acknowledgement that cultural differences are profound? and shape our experience of everything, mm -hmm. including the net, mm -hmm. are we then able to say, yeah, but, you know, there is something that is true for everybody who mm -hmm. encounters the net. Mm -hmm. And these are not just, you know, things that are important, deep, and possibly transformational for many cultures. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't, so I didn't mean to be suggesting that there wasn't. Um, and so, so here probably is a good place to admit that 
liberalism makes its way back in to what I do. Um, but what I say is that it's not necessarily the case that you want to throw out all the aspirations of liberalism just because it's a really crappy descriptive um, tool. Right? It tells you nothing about the way the world works, but some of its aspirations are pretty cool. Um, and critical subjectivity, for example, is an aspiration um, of liberalism. Just hasn't done a very good job at recognizing how you get that. Um, uh, uh, um, the free spread of you know, a corpus of existing knowledge um, so one thing I would say would be a residue if, you know, if it were being done differently. Imagine the digital library, the perfect digital library, um, <laughs> in which you could have access to all published books. Um, you know, not exactly the way it's working out, but it could be really cool. Um, and, you know, you could still take and make w of it what you wanted to, but I would argue that that's a universal good, or it ought to be. Um, and so I'm not trying to say I have a, 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 a you know, a neutral universal prescription um, for a structure upon which any vision of human flourishing could fit. Um, I'm trying to articulate a vision that includes both critical subjectivity and access to the tools necessary to develop it. Does that answer your question? Okay. Very fruitful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Christian's line of, que of questioning. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has been, uh, linguistics as a discipline has mm -hmm. been accused, or at least mainstream linguistics, have mm -hmm. been accused by some people of creating this kind of artificial object of study called a language um, at, at the expense of eliminating speakers and people. Mm -hmm. uh, so creating this thing that can be actually dis dissected and manipulated and mm -hmm. studied scientifically. Um, and so I wonder whether something, some similar accusation can be raised against um, um, cyber law or internet studies or, or these disciplines for using the idea of the cyberspace um, as this kind of like spatial metaphor that is very cool for conceptualizing what's going on, mm -hmm. but at the same time it kind of erases uh, people from uh, the idea mm -hmm. uh, of from what's being studied. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder whether you can draw that kind of parallel there, because it seems to me the idea of cyberspace, mm -hmm. it, it creates this Mm -hmm. sense of something real and concrete that is there, mm -hmm. but it actually does it at the expense of thinking about that without the experience of everyday users that right. you were talking about. Before. Right, and I wrote a whole paper about this actually, which I'm drawing on a lot for the book. Um, uh, but um, I agree with that. Um, you know, there's a tendency to reify cyberspace, mm -hmm. make it separate, and then just, you know, project our fantasies of social ordering onto it, whatever those fantasies happen to be, and there's a lot of divergence on that. And the term I like to use instead is network space, um, which is a space that is real, right, and is connected by networks. And that changes um, and is kind of rearranged as a result of what networks can do. Um, so, you know, 200 years ago, you would not have said Paris was closer to New York than um, Williamsburg, Virginia, but today you might because there are lots of people who do the Paris to New York thing and don't go south of DC. Um, and, uh, and, and we need to, and, and so networked space is a term that's sort of more amenable to reminding us constantly that we're actually talking about the real world and real people who live in the real world. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, let's go, Doc, Alan, and then Ben. It seems to me you're saying that, mm -hmm. in some ways, that the <coughs> linguistics of the of the better of the subject really do matter. Mm -hmm. That um, we can admit that um, that cyberspace is immaterial and different than real space. But your your draft and and what you've been saying is is full of really concrete metaphors. Mm -hmm. You know space, environment. I really like the geography of experience that a phrase you used early. Okay. Um, because we we not only perceive things that way, we, we they're real. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, other people on the net, I don't even know where they are, but there's zero distance from me on mm -hmm. this. Um, uh, a friend of mine describes the net as a giant zero, and that was a subject of a, a talk I gave a mm -hmm. couple of years ago. Um, and it seems to me that the, the part of the problem and 
may be part of the problem with the way that um, Professor Lessig and others are approaching things. Um, <coughs> has to do with starting with the not just with the assumption of the person as this solitary dot that mm -hmm. you're talking about here, mm -hmm. but this, but two completely different conceptual systems that we're up against. Mm -hmm. The copyright absolutists who say the internet is a plumbing system through which is made to pump content to consumers, mm -hmm. and if you're talking about access, for example, a, a term that is often used, it still sounds like it's you're at the end of a spigot rather than a participant in the middle of this thing, mm -hmm. an inhabitant of this geography of experience. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, you've got the plumbing system. Mm -hmm. You have a content pump. And on the other hand, you have um, an environment. You have, you have spaces with domains and locations that you mm -hmm. visit and have architecture and designers and builders. Mm -hmm. And we can't avoid using either of these metaphors, actually, mm -hmm. because we do packetize things. Mm -hmm. We do send things. We do upload and download. Right. And these two conceptual systems are utterly and completely at odds and yield different policy and yield different law. Mm -hmm. And the first is defaulted. The plumbing system is the one that's sort of defaulted. Mm -hmm. It's the one Charlie's up against with Tenenbaum. And, you know, I, I don't know how to get out of that. I've been mm -hmm. thinking about this for years. But it seems to me these two conceptual systems are utterly at odds. And we're right in the middle of it. I think you've got a very right. creative approach to it, though, right. and I like it. I actually, thank you. I, I think privacy may help to get us out of it because it's so clear that it's not a plumbing system when it comes to privacy. Um, you know, people have tended to be quite comfortable sort of accepting that you have no privacy, get over it. You're all hosed. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but when you put privacy front and center, it's quite clear that it's a geography, right? Um, and, you know, and so, like, for example, some of the stuff the FCC is doing right now, um, I, I would love to be a fly on the wall in there. It's almost like someone told them to just stay out of copyright. But everything else they're doing um, seems more amenable to the environmental slash geographic approach. So I wouldn't say it's completely, you know, out of the realm of possibility. Um, but it's 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 difficult. Go, Julie. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, Julie, this is really interesting. I think sort of captured a lot of the values that people have talked about in this room for past few years, and I was wondering if you could take us ahead a few steps. I think you've convinced most people in this room, uh, and now we want to start putting it into policy, either in, mm -hmm. you know, rule-based laws or rule-based technical systems. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, you just touched on the FCC, is this pr approach amenable to thinking about rule-based systems? Um, and if so, how, and if not, what are some of the other tools we can begin to think in terms of pushing this towards making this the way the world operates? Right. Um, and so when you ask that, you're talking about technical systems, uh, right? Not a lawyer, but I'm also curious what this would okay. look like in a legal framework. Okay. Um, so, so, and I know something about what it might look like in a legal framework and next to nothing about what it would look like in a technical framework, but I want to start there anyway and speculate, right, and come back to the legal framework. So, um, it's, um, it's a conundrum, right, because when you tend to think about design, you tend to think about designing rules to produce particular results, and I'm kind of talking about the opposite, designing rules that leave space. Um, and yet, people are starting to think that way in different contexts, not entirely successfully. So there's this whole discussion about can you anonymize data? And it turns out that we thought you could, and it turns out to be harder than we thought, right? But it hasn't turned out that you can't. It just turns out that you need to relinquish even more control. You need to just trash the data and not be able to get it back, which we have culturally a really hard time doing. Um, but there, uh, you know, there are, I think there's a lot of room to experiment there. Um, the, um, in law, right, what that looks like is just making arbitrary rules, right? You can have the right to make your book into a movie. Telling a sequel to the characters in the book. You don't have the right to stop someone else from setting another story in that world. Why? Because we just don't want to give it to you, right? Um, or, you know, 
you have the right to ask people for these 10 items of information before you decide to give them a mortgage, but you don't have the right to ask them these other ones. Why? Because we think that's good policy. You know, seems simple enough, except that there's a whole um, armature of, of argument that's deployed to kind of whittle that away. Um, but it's not written anywhere that it needs to be that way. Um, there are, you know, so, it, so it's a little harder than that because there are um, various legal doctrines that exist to kind of root out arbitrary decision making. Um, and some of those probably need to be rethought in this context. Um, but, uh, but in principle, I don't see that it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So one more in-room question, then I want to pull in a couple from the online chat, and I want okay. to reserve one for myself. Cool. <laughs> okay, so all this discussion about network spaces and the origin of the internet um, and its purpose always makes me think of academia, you know, the sort of birthplace of, you know, the network, and uh, the virtue of, you know, closed spaces and, and cultures and schools, as well as the opportunity to share things beyond the, the boundaries. And uh, I'm interested in this. I, I have a nonprofit open education website myself. And uh, one of the things I've, I've noticed is that there's great communication and fluid idea sharing within the university space, but very rarely does that knowledge and discussion uh, escape the walled garden. It's kind of mm -hmm. unique. I mean, we're in a strange place here, uh, kind of on the cutting edge. We're broadcasting ourselves on the internet, but most schools and classrooms don't do such things. And I wonder if you think there's a unique place for the arguments you're making uh, within the space of education and academics uh, in terms of sharing knowledge openly, as well as the need in many cases to remain private and maintain that space of intimacy in the mm -hmm. classroom where you can explore and experiment without uh, outside eyes. I think, um, I actually, it's a great question. I think those dynamics are actually really well recognized, but often subconsciously, right, by folks who move in these communities. So, you know, any good educator will be able to have opinions, and there will be a lot of convergence um, in those opinions about how certain things are best reserved for a closed, you know, there's some some slippage between do you want it to be just in the classroom or chat but limited to members of the class and other things are okay for a larger forum and a larger forum. Um, any academic who's been an academic for a while will have um, um, pretty well-formed opinions about um, what kind of draft you should be sharing with how many people um, and what kinds of discussions are better had one-on-one -on -one or in a workshop or at a symposium or just, you know, on a blog. Um, and I think that what we don't do um, enough, nearly enough, is draw attention to the way all of these systems work and what's valuable about them. And we take everything and try to figure out how we can port it onto the internet and make it bigger. Right? I'm talking to people. I have no idea who the hell they are. That's They're fine from for this, <laughs> right? But um, but but you know, there's a value to examining that um, and identifying. You know, hey, wait a second. You're questioning this. Uh, not you personally, but if if you question the the semantic discontinuity idea, look at all the ways it exists in your world, right? And that you value. Um, to such a large extent that you take them for granted often. So. I'm going to let Doc do the channeling for a second oh, here from uh, Wendy uh, Seltzer, uh, whom you do it, know, but who is yeah. Yeah. listening. <laughs> she says, uh, why is it so clear that the internet isn't a plumbing system with regard to privacy? And should we give the next comment? Yeah. To see you and she it. says, we, um, in italics, uh, create bulges in the plumbing, not the net. We create bulges in the plumbing. So you're like a clog in the sewer. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I suppose it all depends on your point of view. So if you run a data aggregation business, you would be inclined to see it that way. Um, but I think that you take, you know, any any executive of a data aggregation business and ask him or her um, about uh, how he or she feels about this gender neutral stuff is going to kill me, how he feels about his privacy in his own life. 
Um, and whether, you know, he wants to have in his company's database, um, you know, how often a week uh, he takes an extra drink or the fact that his favorite television show is Fear Factor or whatever, um, that person is going to have opinions about that um, that are completely inconsistent with his professional existence. I think I, I think it's a very rare person. That it's not that they don't exist. So like the Steve Mann surveillance stuff um, we all know about. So there, there are these people who believe that they should document and share everything about their existence with people. But it's not where most of us are. Um, and there's a lot of good that comes from the fact that that's not where most of us are. And that should matter in the policy space to a lot uh, greater extent than it has done. Um, so, you know, I resist the idea that the Internet is a plumbing system where privacy is concerned, not because you can't see it that way, but because you shouldn't. And we don't. So. That's good. Um, do you mind if I take one myself? Absolutely not. Uh, so I want to just return to the... Um, uh, notion initially from your um, mm -hmm. privacy visibility article, one of the things that was so exciting to me was this idea that you took um, aim at the U.S. privacy scholars' resistance to theoretical approaches from other fields and so forth, particularly the surveillance studies people. And mm -hmm. I think you start to open up a lot of things that then you open up mm -hmm. you know, further here that mm -hmm. just seems really interesting and exciting and a challenge to most of us doing legal work um, as a research matter, right? You really um, basically say to all of us, you're not looking at this with the proper frame and you're not using all the tools you could. And mm -hmm. that's, I think, just incredibly helpful and um, you do it very broadly in both of these works, but you also then apply it to our field, which I think is great. Um, one of the things that Wendy was raising in the chat, which is where I think some of this can be um, also so fruitful, is at these kind of sticking points where things like free expression come up against privacy. So mm -hmm. we have intuitions that free expression is good on the net and openness is good on the net and free culture is good on the net. We also have intuitions that you know privacy is important and so forth. And I feel like one thing that you are pointing toward is ways of handling these um, uh, sort of sticking points between things that we, in our first instance, just think mm -hmm. are good, you know, motherhood and apple pie, free expression and privacy, mm -hmm. you're actually saying, no, actually, a lot of this stuff is an interesting conflict, and maybe if you brought the right tools to bear, we would have a more thoughtful, holistic um, policy approach. That may be over-reading into what mm -hmm. you're trying to do, um, but I'd, sort of, I'd love to hear how you think this tool set will help us at these difficult mm -hmm. um, kind of points of tension. So that's actually really useful. Thank you so much, because that's exactly the claim that um, you need the discontinuity to manage the conflict, mm -hmm. right? Um, there isn't a single unifying framework that can make it all make sense in that people have really strongly held beliefs, feelings, intuitions, what have you, about how different kinds of information should be treated differently. Mm -hmm. Everybody should get access to, you know, Wikipedia. Um, everybody shouldn't get access to my diary. Now, if I become a famous person and someone wants to write about my diary on Wikipedia, then we have, you know, it gets, it can get hard. Mm -hmm. But, um, but the a function of these semantic discontinuities, as I'm calling them, and actually the way they have functioned in the real world is exactly to manage that. Mm -hmm. um, so that so it's not that you don't have problems, it's not that disputes don't arise, it's not that you don't have you know this or that public outrage, it's that you have a way to kind of muddle along um, uh, and, and, and have it make sense uh, and, and in a way that most people can, can live with. Um, the, uh, there's a really good book, this is kind of a segue a little bit, but um, one of my favorite books it's a really rough read, um, but um, but I like it anyway. It's by a woman called Catherine Hales, and it's called How We Became Posthuman. Mm -hmm. And she's a literary scholar, but she looks at the um, she goes back to the early reports of a series of meetings on you know how to understand information. And they had just a wild motley crew of people, including Margaret Mead, and mm -hmm. you know people you wouldn't necessarily expect to be in these meetings. And out of it ultimately came um, uh, the um, sort of modern understanding of cybernetics. Mm -hmm. um, but there were moments when it could have gone differently. And, and, and um, as I understand it, right, one sort of received truth, of, you know, within the cybernetic worldview is that information is information regardless of its physical state. Um, you know, it's the same. It passes through minds and, and artifacts, but it's all, you know, unified. Um, and I actually think 
that's wrong, right? Um, we are analog in some really important ways. Um, and you see it, you know, that you could look, the whole history of efforts to design artificial intelligence is an is, you know, trying to make a computer be analog in certain ways that it just has a hard time doing. Um, you know, an artist can look at, um, you know, a bunch of other paint, a bunch of paintings and a carrot growing in the garden and see that it's cloudy and go, oh, you know, I should do this. And it's really hard to teach a computer to do that. And it's really important. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's worth thinking about why it's important and trying to make sure we don't get rid of it. Hugely fruitful. Um, I wrote a uh, book with Urs Gusser, as you know, called Born Digital. And one of the things someone did right after the book came out was gave a T-shirt to my seven-year-old son, which says, I am analog, which he wears every <laughs> single day to bed to remind me. <laughs> I have to put in a, a plug for my, my uh, colleague and friend, Chris Sprigman at Virginia, who's selling a T-shirt that says, God hates Twitter. You could get one of those, too. Get in touch with him. So um, we'll all write to Chris. And um, uh, before we do so, though, mm -hmm. um, Julie has uh, not only taught one class today, not only shared this lunchtime with us, but she's going to teach another class later today. So we should thank her profusely um, and let her go. So, Julie, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. Not to say the question.